Okay. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. This is Tanya Lux, and I'm the marketing manager for digital arts here at Corel. And I also have Brandon McDonald on the webinar here with me today. So we're going to be doing some co-presenting. Um, we're going to show you all kinds of things today. As you know, we recently launched Painter Essentials 6. And I'm going to kick things off with a little bit of photo art, and then I'm going to let Brandon wow you with um, illustration, uh, since that's really not my forte, <laughs> as you all probably know, because I've been at Corel for quite some time. So just a, a few little items of business. Um, you can enter any questions that you have into the questions panel. We're gonna be taking certain breaks to answer those questions. So for my portion of the presentation, I'm not gonna be keeping an eye on the questions panel, but I will stop, take a peek in there and make sure that I address your questions after um, each phase of the demo that I show. If we can't answer everything during the session, then um, we'll do our best to follow up and get your questions answered after the session. So this is probably gonna go an hour because we have two of us presenting. Um, so. We hope you're gonna enjoy everything. I hope that you guys have at least downloaded the trial, if not purchased Painter Essentials. Um, there is a 30-day trial, so I just wanna let everybody know about that. And it's a fully functional trial, so please download that. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and minimize these controls for right now, and if you guys are having any issues, I'm just looking in the questions panel right now, um, I don't see that there's any sound issues or whatnot, so I'm gonna go ahead and continue on. Yes, I we are recording this, and I will send you all the link to the recording in the GoToMeeting follow-up tomorrow morning, okay? So, and it'll probably be posted on YouTube by the end of today. It just takes a little bit to process it. So I'm gonna go ahead and minimize these controls, and let's get started here. So hopefully you are all seeing Painter Essentials is open, and I've got the welcome screen that greets you. So from within here, you can see everything that's new. Um, the what's new will also have, you know, kind of things that we have going on, webinars and whatnot. Then we've got the tutorials, the gallery. I bet many of you that are attending today, we probably have some of your artwork in the gallery. We do a call out every year to gather artwork. Um, and then you can also, this time around, upgrade to Painter 2018. So in case you weren't aware, that's a new upgrade path for everybody. And finally, we also allow you to purchase extra brush packs that you can use in Painter Essentials. That was not an option in Painter Essentials 5. So I'm gonna go ahead and close out. And the very first thing that I'm gonna do is open up a photo because I'm fo focusing on photo art here today. And all the way over on the left, I have my toolbar. So I just dragged it out there so you can see it. And anytime you see a little arrow pointing down into the right, these are flyout menus. So you can click and then you can select other tools. So if you've never done that, you can take a peek in there and see the other options that are available. I'm just going to zoom in a couple times on the image that I have here so that you guys have a nice large preview. And to let you know, I am using a Wacom Intuos Pro tablet. It's a medium size, um, just the standard stylus with that. But I do highly recommend that everybody use a drawing tablet with Painter Essentials. It makes the experience much more realistic. All right, so we've got our photo here, and to kick things off, I actually don't even have to select any brushes or anything like that, because we have this photo painting panel that will open up by default. And one other thing that I do want to open up is my layers. So let's go ahead and get that. And we've got both of these here to work with. So I'm gonna begin by saying, okay, we're in the photo painting panel. And there's three stages to this, or three steps. So first, you need to pick your image. I'm gonna use the open image. And what happens is it's created a new document 
it's taken the photo off the canvas, but Painter Essentials is smart and it still has a photo reference there for you to paint from. So what I just did is in the, the third section down here, tracing paper can be turned on and you can adjust the opacity level of the tracing paper, minimize, maximize. Um, and what you can do with this is, you know, let's say you wanted to hand sketch using this kind of as your light board reference, you can certainly do that. And I'll show you that a little bit later. So to begin with, we're gonna keep things simple and we're gonna start by auto painting. So the second section right here, if you click the menu, it drops down, there's all different types of painting styles. And I would encourage you to experiment with all of these. I'm not going to do that here today. I'm gonna to start off by selecting watercolor sketch. When you select a style, all you have to do is click the start button and Essentials will do its thing. So it begins with really big, broad strokes, and you see that it's minimizing the size of those strokes, it's bringing in more detail from the original source image, and eventually, when it's done, it'll just stop. You can also click the canvas at any point in time that you may want to, to stop the painting on your own. Sometimes I like to do that if I like a little more abstract paint on the canvas that I then go in and fine tune by hand painting. So this is the watercolor sketch. It's nice, but I wanna show you some other options for creating this sketchy kind of, you know, the lines that drawing that you see within this. So I'm gonna say edit, undo, or command or control Z. And we're gonna take a look at a couple other options that you have here. So we could do something like a pencil drawing so this is going to sketch out in pencil. Um, when it's all done, it's gonna fill everything in for me. This is much more than just you know, a, line, a little sketchy line. It's kind of filling in the shaded areas of the image. So that's another option that you have. And the third one would be the pen and ink. So I'm just gonna click here to stop that painting. And once again, Command or Control Z to undo, and you also have the pen and ink drawing. Okay, so once I show you all of these, um, and Karen Boniker did a tutorial where she used this pen and ink drawing, and she explained that you can actually play this multiple times, and it will continue to build up the sketch lines so that they're a little bit darker. Okay, so there's three options, um, one with the sketch included with watercolor, and then the other two auto paintings but we can also do something else. So I'm gonna close out of this and we'll just open our image back up again. Zoom in a couple times. And I'm gonna come up to the effects menu and go to surface control and sketch. So this is really nice as well um, if you haven't explored this because now you can come in and you can adjust the sensitivity level. You have a little more control outside of using the auto paint, which you know takes all the control over for you. I can maximize the amount of grain I want to display. Um, we have a very subtle paper texture selected right now. So if I cancel and I come back out and I choose something that's a little bit bolder, let's say these small dots, and now we come back, go to surface control and sketch, you'll see that it does exhibit that paper texture much more. So the more that you bump up the grain, the more of the texture that you're going to see. So I probably wouldn't have gone with this texture, but for time's sake, I'm just gonna say, let's go ahead and say, okay. And we are going to save our sketch. So Painter's, Painter Essentials native file format and Painter is the riff. And that will preserve, if you have added multiple layers, it will save all of those for you. Um, I'm just gonna go ahead and we'll call this Havana Sketch. And I can click Save It Uncompressed so there's no compression whatsoever. And now, I'm gonna open up that original image again. And this time, we're gonna say, okay, let's go ahead and auto paint. And I want to do this time the detailed watercolor. So the detailed watercolor is not going to add a sketch to the canvas. So this is where if you choose that you want, you know, a customized sketch, we can add our own sketch on top of the detailed watercolor. 
giving it kind of our own spin on the artwork. So once this is done, um, I had I do notice here that it's because it's watercolor, this particular auto painting mode has lightened the color palette a little bit. You may like that, you may not like that. If you don't, we can certainly go in and adjust the colors within this. So if I come up to my tonal control, I'm gonna say maybe put a little more contrast, lower the brightness to make the colors pop a little more. There's other options that you have, but we'll just do a quick down and dirty. And now I am going to place my sketch into this painting. So all we have to do is come up to the file menu. I'm gonna say place. There's the sketch. So I'm gonna go ahead and open up that RIF file. <clears throat> and we'll just pop it down. I accidentally clicked there, guys. So that's why I dumped it where it did. Now we have an issue because we can't see through this layer, but within the layers palette, we have our merge modes. So if you do a gel or a multiply, both of those are going to take your sketch and make anything that's white transparent so that we can see through to the watercolor layer underneath. And there we have it. Now, I do notice because the auto painting technique that we selected, the watercolor, it faded the edges out. So I just flip my stylus over and that gives me the eraser. And you know, anywhere that I didn't wanna see the sketch where it's supposed to be fading at the edges, we can go and erase that away. I'm not gonna be too concerned with making sure that I've finalized all my paintings for you today. I just wanna give you the main techniques. And then to finish everything off, I'm gonna go ahead and drop everything down to the canvas. And if we were gonna display this online, I might want a nice paper texture included. So we've got the texture that was in the sketch itself. Um, I'm gonna say, let's maybe choose a soft press watercolor. And we go to surface control, apply surface texture, and now we can actually add that paper texture. I'm gonna minimize a bit because we don't need it to be quite so bold. You could even change the lighting. So there's all kinds of controls that you have here. And now I'm gonna say, okay. And there we have our final watercolor painting. So that's pretty easy to use the auto painting, the auto sketch, the auto texture. So let's go ahead and close out of this. And next I'm going to open up this wedding photo. Um, I wanted to be sure that I showed you some examples of landscape and people, and hopefully I'm gonna have time to get to my still life as well. Okay, so we have this beautiful sunset wedding photo here. And before I move on, uh, before I forget, I'm gonna just take a peek in the questions to make sure that I'm answering everything for you guys, because I know I'm speeding through this process here. So bear with me. Um, okay, so Nancy, I'll follow up with you about the trial. Let's see. Um, okay, so to view the layers for Trista, um, just in case, I think you probably saw me go to the window menu and make sure that your layers are open. That's Command or Control 4, depending upon which platform you're on. Okay, so how do you make transparency in the layers? I'll review that one again for you. It's within, um, in the layers palette here, and I don't have the drop down accessible, so I'll just add another layer. This drop down right here is your merge modes where you can change, and the one that I used was gel. You can also use multiply, and that's what makes the white transparent. So I'll just dump that layer there. Okay, um, exporting paintings to a PSD is literally just file, save as PSD, and auto paint, how do you get it to fill the whole canvas? Um, that is actually a matter of the style that you choose. So the watercolor that I selected, by default doesn't fill the detailed watercolor, it puts a soft edge on the canvas. Um, and there is no way to change that. You could run the auto paint and then hand paint in the edges if you wanted to. All right, 
Now, I'm going to go ahead and close the questions down here, and we'll move on to our next painting. Let me just move these questions down. And I'll put the layers panel back over on the right so it's not hanging out on the painting. Okay, so next I'm going to once again use an auto painting technique, but then we're gonna do some hand touching up. So this time I'm gonna choose a modern painting um, style. So this is gives me nice vibrant colors um, I think it actually saturate the, saturates the colors even a little bit more than the original photo had. And in the end, you know, it's going to leave, there's, there's not a whole ton of detail here. And because we're dealing with people, we want to make sure that, you know, certain parts of this image have a little bit more detail. So once you auto paint, if you want to bring back any part of the original photo, we still have that tracing paper, remember? So that means that we can bring part of the original photo back in if we want to. So when you're auto painting, by default, the brush category that gets selected are the photo painting brushes. The brush that you will use, and by default, it selects it when you're auto painting, is the soft cloner this is the one that's going to allow me to bring back in, and depending upon the pressure that I place on the, the stylus on the tablet, that's going to determine how much or how little of the original image that I bring back in. So I like to make sure, you know, the important parts, like I want their hands, their faces, and then I'm going to grab, you know, a nice pastel -y brush and we'll go in and we can fine tune certain parts of this image. So I can brush over these parts that I've now brought the photo back in to give it a little bit more texture. All right. So that's good. Um, you know, you can even clean up some of the edges. I'm not going to go into too much detail in, in creating the entire painting. So let's just come over down here to the left. And I am going to move out of the photo painting brushes. So what these photo painting brushes do, and I'll just demonstrate this quickly. Let's say I grab the Impressionist cloner and I want to begin painting with this. I can size up my brush up on the property bar or I can hold Control, Option, click, drag, and that will allow me to size my brush. So by default, when you're using photo painting brushes, they're going to paint with the colors from the photo. So now I've got an impressionist brush and, you know, it's painting using the colors from the photo and I can begin to modify and fill, you know, give it a little bit more painterly effect. As I move outside of the photo painting brush category, let's say that I want to choose chalk pastel crayons and maybe a square chalk. If I still want to paint with the colors from the source image, all I have to make sure of is that this little button over here, clone color from source image, is checked. And what that's going to do for me is it's going to allow me to, once again, do like we were just doing with the um, Impressionist cloner, is to pull the colors from the source image using, now we've got a square chalk. Okay, so I could come in and just kind of roughen up. I'm doing a little circular motion down on the bottom here to kind of blend in some of this. So I went ahead and did this sort of process. And just to give you a, a hint, the larger the size of your brush, the less detail it's going to bring in. So it's gonna kind of take and smear things around, the smaller that you size the brush. When you're working with um, something like a photo painting or photo art, the more detail it'll bring in. So if I want to begin to paint the bouquet here, if I get a small size brush, it's not going to completely obliterate the details. It'll allow me to, you know, keep the shapes of the objects, but I can give this a little bit more painterly feel to it. And I could do the same thing, you know, by coming up, maybe even want to go a little bit smaller 
to start blending in her hair and maybe in skin. So this is all I did. I think I spent maybe 10 minutes on my entire painting, which I have here for you because I know that we have limited time during the webinar. And this was using the modern painting, auto paint. And then I just used the square chalk and came in and, you know, small brush to brush over the areas that I wanted to bring out details and the larger brush to do more of the blending. And it's super simple, guys. So I encourage you to, you know, if you're just diving into painting, starting with auto paint and then doing some hand touch up is a great way to go. So let me just take a peek in the questions panel here. All right. Um, having, okay, let's see, can, sorry guys, can you do the cloning to get detail on a separate layer so that it's non-destructive? Yes, you can. So all you need to do if you want to clone into a new layer is to add a layer like I just did right there. So all the way down at the bottom of the layers panel, and I'll pull it up here so everybody can see, is the new layer button. And when I um, collapsed my layers or dropped them before, that is the one all the way over on the left. And you can delete layers as well. Um, so from there, yes, you can begin to, you know, just start painting on that layer and it's still gonna pull the colors from the original photo. All right, cool. Good thing, I guess, that there's not a ton of questions. So let me shrink this down here and I'm gonna move on to my last um, painting for you guys. So let's close out of this one. I'm just pressing Command or Control W um, or you can say File Close. All right, so now let's open up our third image here, which is my cone flower. And we're going to, this time, not do any kind of auto painting, but we still want to paint from the photo. So in order to do that, we need to say, okay, I want to photo paint, I want to use the open image, and we need the tracing paper. So I'm going to turn that on. What I would like to do now is to hand sketch using this as a reference. So let's go to the pen, pencils, pens, markers category. There's a ton of nice sketching tools to work from. Um, I have found a lot of artists love the scratch board, the thick and thin pencil. So it's really a matter of preference. I'm gonna go ahead and use the scratch board tool. And instead of cloning the color from the source image, I'm gonna turn that off. I wanna select my own color. So here you have your um, color wheel. And if you click in any of these gray areas, you can move this around and place it elsewhere within the interface. The inside is the saturation or value of whatever hue you select on the outside. I just want black. So let's turn the tracing paper off, Command or Control T, or you can click over here in the photo painting panel. I want to take a look at the brush. Um, so this is where using a stylus is really wonderful because if I press light, I get a thin stroke. If I press hard, I get a thicker stroke. Um, so this is great for sketching. And I'm not going to be real exact here, guys. So I'm just going to use this as a reference. And we're going to kind of and I'm not going to worry about being perfect, um, but we can still use this paint or, or the image underneath to paint from. Oof. Okay, I should probably rotate my... So I made a little boo-boo there. I'm going to go ahead and flip the stylus over. Okay, so Command or Control T. Then we can see my sketch there. I already warned you guys that I'm not an artist, so bear with me here. <laughs> But it is fun just to sketch. You know, you can use a photo reference to make things a little bit easier. And that was not a good angle. So we'll just erase down here. 
but hopefully you guys get the idea. So what I wanted to show you with this is that you can hand sketch, um, which I'm doing right now, and then we'll, we'll add maybe another petal up here. Turn the tracing paper off. I'm gonna put a little stem in. And now I'm gonna to go to the digital watercolors, which I really like for filling in color and using this broad water brush. Now, the mistake that I just made, it's painting with black. Because remember I said, oh, I don't wanna clone the color from the source image, I wanna paint with this. So undo, undo. Click this little guy right here to clone the color from the source image. And now, I can paint using watercolor, and it's pulling the colors from the original image, and this is a pretty quick process. I find these brushes are very forgiving. Um, they do a really nice job of bringing in you know, subtle blends of colors. So if I come down to the petal here, you know, I can begin to fill this in. So this is a nice, easy way if you wanted to do you know, something that looked more like your own illustration. And what I probably should have done is to add an additional layer so that I separate the watercolor from the sketch because if I want to erase something, I don't want to erase my sketch along with it. Um, so this is another way that you can create a unique type of painting that's just not a, a straight auto paint. If I want to paint that stem, we're going to turn that off. We're going to come over here grab a little green and paint the stem in. And if I wanted to throw some fun stuff in the background, I'm gonna grab the spatter water and maybe we'll size up the brush and you know we can start having some fun. So it's very quick to do this. I'm gonna go ahead and just open up the painting that I created. None of these paintings took me longer than probably 10 minutes maximum. And it's all using the techniques that I just showed you here. So I promised Brandon that I wouldn't go over 25 minutes, and I have. So let me go ahead and close down here. And while I take a look at your questions, I'm gonna pass control over to him so that he can get set up here. Um, so we're luck so lucky to have Brandon here with us. I hope that some of you have seen the tutorials that he created. Um, he has a couple wonderful illustration tutorials that were available as of the launch of Painter Essentials. He's a very talented artist. Not only does he do traditional oil and acrylics, but obviously he's very well versed in digital art as well. Um, so I'm going to take a quick look at these questions, Brandon, and then I promise I'm turning it over. Okay, let's see. Um, Thank you very much, Tanya. Sure. Okay. So Joni asks, will you be noting new features in 6 from what's in 5? Um, so the welcome screen is new, being able to bring in all of the additional brush packs is new. Um, you know, a few changes to the interface. Um, if you have questions about that, I'm happy to follow up with you, Joni. And, and that's it. So you can take it away. All right, cool. Thank you very much, Tanya. Um, okay, so. Um, First, I just wanted to show you some things that you can do with the program and some things that I like to utilize. Uh, I'm on standard settings on both Corel and on my Wacom tablet. I apologize for any hotkeys that are different because I'm uh, clearly I'm using a Mac. Um, so first, first off, you can use the uh, shift key. Sorry, one second. This is in the way. Okay. So uh, the shift key is great for doing straight lines. Whoops. <laughs> you can do straight, horizontal, uh, vertical, or diagonal lines. 
And you can also, with this selector, you can either choose a lasso with L and you can select, say, just a random piece, go to transform, and you can hold shift and move it around straight. That way you can move it straight down or straight to the right, because sometimes that's necessary when you're drawing. Also, um, select none. Also, the N key is your eraser. So you can go back and forth really quick to B and back to N. So you don't have to be going up here to eraser or over here to eraser and back to pen. You can just press B or N. Um, also, the V key will create straight lines. And you can just click V again to reset it because otherwise it'll just continue on like this. Um, let's see, you can um, change your brush size by pressing on a Mac by pressing Alt and Command and then dragging your stylus on your tablet. So you can change the brush size very quickly. Oops. Let's select darker color. So yeah, you can change the brush size very quickly and easily. And it's just, it's just very useful to, to use your hotkeys. Um, also, uh, um, just alt alone is the color picker. So let me see. You can rotate your canvas by pressing alt and the button on your pen or stylus that is closest to the point or nib. Uh, so you just press Alt, which is the color picker, and then click the button on your stylus closest to the nib, and you can rotate, which is very useful for doing certain like lines, because sometimes you, it's easiest for me to do, here, let me, it's easiest for me to do curved lines this way, so if I, if I come to something where I need to, you know, it's just easier to draw a certain way, you can just rotate the canvas around. It's very useful. And to get it back to normal, you can just press Alt, then your stylus button, and just tap the screen, and it sends it back to normal. So you got to rotate it and just tap it. Um, so you can move around your canvas by holding that button down on your stylus without the Alt key, but just the, the stylus button closest to the nib. Um, and just kind of move it around wherever you need. Also, this is really useful. I usually prefer to have the recent brushes visible on your window. So that's the, whoops, that's these up here and also your navigator, which is down here, and your layers over here. So navigator is very useful, navigator is very useful because you can zoom in really easily. You don't have to go over here and use the zoom out, zoom in. You can just do it like this. And it's, it's more precise because this, I think it's, it's quick, but I prefer to use this personally. Um, let's see what else. Um, I usually have like six to eight go-to brushes. I like the color or the cover pencil. It it's quite nice. It's a soft line, and also when you make it really large, it's a nice. It's very soft, and the concept. What is this concept art jitter smooth, and the jitter means uh, it's pressure sensitive. So you can do it really soft or, or really hard. And the cool thing about this brush is that, the cool thing about this brush is that it's very soft on one side and hard on the other. And it's just so, so nice. Um, also you have the scratchboard tool, which Tanya mentioned, it's very, 
uh, hard and great for doing kind of graphic stuff or, you know, hard sketches. And the square chalk is very good for texture. Um, the glow tool is fun to use. You can make like fire or, or lights or, you know, it's, it's really nice. And it has that variation in color. So you have this kind of blue, uh, kind of tealy blue, and then it goes more into green. So it's got a really nice color variation. It goes from white to yellow to orange to red. Um, but yeah, even though I have my set brushes, I recommend um, trying all kinds of brushes because I usually just keep these for work because they're, you know, they're just my go-to. I know that they're going to do what I want them to do. Um, sorry, got my notes. Uh, when I'm feeling kind of uninspired or in a slump, I often will um, use the mirror tool or the kaleidoscope tool. It's really fun to use. Um, it's great for doodling. You can, so you go over here and click the kaleidoscope or sometimes it, see it changes the, the icon design. But uh, I like to do co um, kaleidoscope, sorry. <laughs> I like to, I'm shorting out. I like to, um, do mandalas sometimes just for fun. And let me show you real quick. What am I doing? Okay. Can change the number of segments here. And you can change the color of the lines here. So if you want to really make them visible or if you kind of want them, you know, not visible. But it's quite fun to mess around with. You know, it doesn't you can you can make pretty ugly lines and it still comes out to look quite nice because it's, you know, it's duplicated perfectly. So even if you're doing like kind of ugly lines, it's still going to look kind of fun. And um, yeah, oops. So yeah, I don't know. Just, um, and the the um, the mirror tool is pretty fun to use. I did these with the mirror tool very quickly. Uh, you can change the plane. So this is the horizontal plane. So I made this little bow and this little axe uh, just because it's duplicated perfectly. And here's just another quick mandala scribble that I did. Um, and this is kind of a little book cover type design, I guess, that I was able to do with the vertical plane and the horizontal plane act, um, active. Is that what you would say? Um, but yes. yes. Hello? <laughs> I said yes. Oh. When you have the horizontal or vertical plane active. Yes. Um, so did you, were there any questions before I continue? You know, um, not so far. So keep okay. on going. Okay. Um, let me see. So. Here. Uh, I just like to show a little bit more of the duplicator tool and just how you can kind of mess around with it. So here's a little dwarf that I drew a while ago and you can draw your design like this and um, select it, copy and make it invisible, paste in place, and then you can make it a multiply layer. So it just 
so you can see through it, but it darkens it. Go to transform and you can size it down using the shift key to keep it the same exact size. Uh, well, same dimensions, I guess. And put it where you want it. And choose distort to make it fit a little better, like fit the body part or whatever you're doing, because you can do tattoos or decals or whatever, whatever kind of design you want. And you can change the opacity of the layer. I'm going to erase this little part that his armband is covering. And you can change the color of it, going to effects, tonal control, adjust colors, maybe give it more of a more of a blue kind of color. And yeah, so there's a little tattoo. And here is a little design on his apron. I did the same way just by drawing it with the, with the duplicator tool or the uh, mirror tool. And this one's actually on screen. So it is lightened. It's a lightened layer. Um, yes. Um, so now I just want to go through some basic uh kind of basic drawing stuff get this open so uh first you should learn how to draw your basic shapes like the sphere the cone pyramid cylinder cube etc uh, there are tons of different shapes but these are good ones to start with depending on the shape size and distance from the viewer the shape can warp pretty drastically a sphere will still stay a perfect sphere um, no matter what distance or size it is or what angle you're looking at it from. But a cube, a cube will do the same if you're looking head on at it. It's not going to change shape. Um, but all of the other shapes change depending on distance, size, or how you're looking at them. So here I've got a, uh, for example, a die will stay a perfect cube from most distances because it's so small. It'll really only change shape if it's extremely close to your eye or if you're viewing it uh, from an ant's perspective. But a house or something incredibly large will only be a perfect cube from very far away. Um, so here is what a building looks like from like. Let's see, when you're about a street's width away from it. So notice how it's definitely not a perfect cube shape. Um, well, I mean, it, it is because of the perspective we're looking at it, but, but it's not this typical cube shape. <clears throat> so, um, so we're going to try to understand uh, how to draw this. So... If you, uh, if you follow the lines out from the top and the bottom of the building, where those lines intersect, so this line here and these red lines here, where they intersect is where your horizon line is going to be at. The horizon line is the green here. Uh, they usually look like, whoops, what the heck? Hold on one second. Where is, is that it? Did I not save it? Hmm, guess I didn't save it. But this is actually, I'll just draw it. So using the kaleidoscope tool, this is actually a good way to do, to draw your um, vanishing point lines. So these are the lines that run into your vanishing point. And you can use the kaleidoscope tool, select a pencil or scratch tool or the cover pencil, whichever, and use a small, small brush 
hold shift and go from the center up. What the heck? I was holding shift. Why is that not working? So this is usually what your vanishing points look like. It just looks like a little star, but they're just they're just guidelines. And if you'll notice, all of these lines run into this point. Same with all of these lines that the windows, if you can see it, all these lines that the windows are, are running on run down to this point. Um, so. That's a very good tip. Oh, thanks. I never thought of that before. It's really useful. Um, so, sorry, one second. Um, okay. That's <laughs> I threw my notes. So, did you, did you just experiment and learn this stuff on your own, or did you have certain references that you relied on? Um, it's a little of it's a little of both. I watch a lot of um, YouTube tutorial videos, like as much as possible, watching speed paints or, you know, just professional people drawing. And also, it's, it's trial and error as well. Um, so, and because you're you're looking at this uh, from the ground level, the top of the building is further from your eye, so it has to taper a bit, meaning there's another vanishing point way up in the sky. Uh, this is a three point. This is what's known as a three point perspective. So you have a point here point here and a point way up top. Uh, if you're looking at the building at half of its height, so if you're looking at it right here or from right here, that would be a two points, a two point perspective. So these lines would be straight and you would only have a point here and a point here. I drew it before, but I didn't save it for some reason. Um, so, on to, do, are there any questions, I guess? Yeah, um, Cassandra is wondering, do you actually paint along with YouTube tutorials? Um, no, actually, I usually just try to absorb as much as I can. And if there is a really good note that I think I might forget, I, I'll write it down. Uh, I when I first started painting, I was just t making tons of notes, just always making notes and referring to them and being as methodical as possible until I got kind of comfortable. And then I just started, you know, painting more freely. It's kind of the, the best way to do it is try to be as methodical as possible from the beginning and then start to kind of be more loose and and free with it. Okay. Now John is asking if you do a lot of freehand drawing. Uh, yeah. Um, let's see. So I have. Um, here's here's a character that I'll get to later, but he was he was totally freehand, and um, yeah, it's just. You, you get when you get comfortable with it you can kind of you know just kind of throw it out there I don't know how to explain it better than that <laughs> now there's a lot of questions coming in I think um, some of them might be somewhat I'm oh, sorry it just closed out on me let me get it here um, well first of all how long have you been painting um, I've been using Corel for probably like a year or two now. And I, before I was doing tattoos and just been drawing all my life. So. And you've done traditional painting as well, right? Yeah. Yeah. I don't really like it so much. When I, when I first started doing, uh, Corel, uh, it was, 
it was incredible. I mean, you can instantly select colors. You can instantly, everything's instant. Whereas painting, you have to wait for dry time. You have to, you know, you have to clean your brushes. You have to mix your own colors. You can't instantly select a color. It's just so much faster and so much nicer. Plus you aren't wasting supplies. I mean, it's, I, I really love digital painting. It's so nice. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and this is a loaded question, but Joni is wondering, how do you color in things like your dwarf? So it's basically just asking, I would think, what brushes do you use to color? Oh. How do you select colors? Do you have a method? Um, yeah. Um, let me, sorry, one second. So I have, let me see if I can find it. This mess of saved images. Don't look. <laughs> um, let's see if I can find it. Yes, it's dwarves. Saved in dwarves. Is it cook? I don't remember what I called them. Oh, yeah. So, in a way. What the heck? There we go. So this is, let me get rid of that. This is usually how I paint. Let me see. So I've got the perspective lines and then there's the little sketch that I did over it, trying to follow these perspective lines. Um, and then there's the color. So this, um, this is just a normal layer, the sketch. And then you have the multiply layer, which is for color. And I just went really light with it. So let me just, you know, very light colors because it's a multiply. And, you know, you make, you can use the soft velocity uh, soft pressure airbrush, a little bit of red to like redden up those elbows and redden up the nose a little bit. And um, yeah, just painting it in usually with the concept brush and the digital airbrush. And then when I get that done, uh, I usually will do a multiply layer and I use the paint bucket. So I'll usually just do the paint bucket so the whole thing is purple. Whoops. Let me make this a normal layer. Back to multiply. So I usually have something like this and then I press N, choose the proper eraser size, uh, turn the opacity down on the eraser down to about 5%. Be sure you're on the hard edge and then you can just erase areas where you want the light to be hitting. And I kind of just do this as the, um, as the, for the cast shadows. So then once that's done, let me back up to where, oops. So then once that's done, you can do another multiply layer for maybe a little bit harder shadows. Uh, there's an overlay of his little writing and even more shadows. Or that's an overlay layer. I kind of, it kind of varies. I just kind of feel out each, each piece. Now I used to be a lot more methodical, but now I'm just kind of, I just kind of do it how how I feel, but usually the way I would do it is sketch, uh, color layer, um, done with multiply. Let me remove these. So you got your sketch, your color layer, then your shadow layer, and then your render layer is usually how I would do it. But I just did all these other steps because I, I don't think I knew what I was doing with this guy. He just kind of came to be. 
So yeah. do you, is there a typical amount of time that you would spend on a painting? Um, Ballpark. Hmm. Cause I know every painting is different. I usually, I think this guy might've taken like three or four hours, something like that. Okay. But like a full illustration can take up to like 12 hours, maybe more. Yeah. That's pretty fast. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I don't illustrate from scratch, but that doesn't once, seem crazy long. Yeah, it's not too bad. Once you really get started doing it, and once you do it a lot, you get a lot faster. Like I've I've gotten very quick with the uh, brush size changes and changing from brush to eraser. So I've got the, once you get the hotkeys down and once you get kind of your technique down, you just get faster and faster. It's, it's just what happens. Do you have a recommendation for learning the hotkeys? I know they can be printed from Painter, but not from Essentials. Oh. I could um, print them from Painter and provide them as a resource because a couple, couple people have asked about this. Um, I would be happy to like find, figure out all the hotkeys that I use and post them somewhere if that helps. But I don't, I don't know. The way I learned was just uh, one at a time. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Well, maybe what I'll do is I'll create a quick reference and get that posted for everybody. I could even just send the um, the printout from Painter, which is going to have more hotkeys, obviously, than Essentials does because it has more features. But that's good, though. People can like pick and choose. Mhm. Mm okay. Cool. Um. So, oh, and while I'm still unmuted, just to give you the time check, it's almost the top of the hour. Okay. Uh, should we... Okay, so maybe I'll skip to this guy real quick or something? Is sure. that Is that okay? <laughs> um, uh... So I've done some painting over one of my drawings I drew recently. I tried to break him down so you can see the perspective and shapes more easily. So this guy, I broke down a bit. So um, here are some of the largest underlying shapes. So you can see that the top part is a cylinder right here. Maybe get my, there. So the top part is a cylinder. <clears throat> and the middle is a sphere, and the bottom is a flared out cylinder. Because he's standing straight up, you're able to have a rough idea of where the horizon line is um, uh, because of the curves in his clothing. And the, what? anything uh, circular that you're looking down on has a downward curve, and anything you're looking up at has an upward curve. So as you can see, the curves get a little bit more extreme as you look up and they get a little bit more extreme as you go down. And it's the same with, with cubes and boxes. They'll, they'll get more angular as you're looking down on them hard, <clears throat> harder. Um, or as if the, uh, if the perspective is a little bit more forced. Um, so then you have some smaller shapes that aren't really affected by the horizon line and the vanishing points. They're not th because they're smaller. Uh, you can see the very basic pyramid shapes uh, as sort of brass spikes and the very basic cylinder shape on his chest. Uh, you don't necessarily have to have super complex shapes to make a good illustration. In fact, simple shapes are easy to read and can be more pleasing to look at. Uh, as you can see, the hand is made up of cylinders. The fish is basically a cylinder as well, just the top half, and then it tapers down to the tail. Um, 
having consistent readable forms is very important. And uh, the shoulder pad is a bit more complex of a shape, sort of like a hexagonal Pringle almost. Uh, Pringle is a chip, if you don't know, or a crisp. Um, so just more finding basic shapes like the cylinder, kind of cylinder tube shape here, and these rings, and this kind of flared out cylinder. Um, here's an area where I screwed up. Um, uh, let's see. I made this other sh other shoulder pad square, as you can see right here, whereas this one kind of flares down. So it should have more of this kind of shape. Um, but probably out of laziness in the beginning, and it just slipped by unnoticed all the way through the shading and rendering process. So basically just don't be lazy in the beginning. Get everything right, and, and you'll just have a stronger, better, better, uh, better illustration. Um, yes, so that's, I think that's it. So many great tips for illustrating. It was awesome. I hope it helps people. Yeah, I, well, you can't see the comments, but um, it seems that you have answered a lot of questions for people. There was one that I typed an answer into the questions panel, but um, John was wondering how you got your recent brushes out of the brush selector. Oh, so, oh, oh, okay. Um, so you go up here to, I, what, I guess it's brushes, brush selector, and you choose a brush you like, and then it will show up in the brush sele selector only if you use it. Because if you select it and then select a different one, it won't show up. So you have to actually like choose a brush you like, use it, and then it'll show up on this little panel. And you've got to go into Window to check recent brushes so you can see it. Great. Thank you. Yeah. I'm just scanning to make sure that we address everybody's questions. Um, there was a question about where in the layers would your background be painted? Is that just on the canvas? Oh, I actually do, um, I have a couple different ways of doing it. Sometimes I will, um, let me see if I can find, sorry, let me do this as quick as I can. Is that, okay, I guess that's the only, Um, so usually I would have this back part all one color and then you can select it or with the gnome actually no let me open the, the dwarf so you can actually select this solid color in the back and uh, create a new layer and you can actually paint in it while it's selected. There are a couple ways you can do this. You can do it this way, like you got, oops, it's just painted like that. So you can do it that way, or, uh, and if you do a crisp outline using the scratch board tool, say in this in this stage with this black or or whatever on actually a new layer um, you can do a crisp outline on a separate layer and then it makes it easier so you can select it so let's just outline his arm here so you got this crisp outline and then you can paint all the rest and then you can select it and how are you doing that quick selection? 
Over here? Oh, the magic okay. wand. I'm sorry. Yeah. The magic That's okay. Wand. Choose the magic wand, and then you click where you want to select. And sometimes, if for example, if you have, um, if you have something like this, where there's all this intricate stuff happening, but the outside is solid, you can select and go to invert selection, and then you can copy him, and you can paste him in place. And that way you can paint on a layer that's beneath him. So he is now above all of the layers, so you can just paint beneath him. You don't also use Painter 2018, do you? Um, I haven't really been able to get into it. Okay. I haven't had had a lot of time to mess with it, but I've been wanting to. <laughs> it's just um, I'm now I lost him in the list. I think Bradley asked that. And have you used any of the brush packs at all, or do you just? I just I know... use the standard brushes. Okay. Yeah, I like them. I think they I think they work perfect. All right. Well, that's good to hear. <laughs> I mean, if, if somebody is looking for a particular workflow, um, then a lot of times the packs can help because you can customize brushes in Painter 2018, but you really you can't customize and save in Essentials. So. Oh yeah. I would oh, like to do are, that. These work great. Yeah. Um, People are asking, can you share different brushes between different Corel programs, or Robert asked this, and no, you cannot. That's an interesting question, though, Robert, <laughs> but I'm sorry to say no for right now. Really only, you know, Painter Essentials is the baby brother of 2018, so, you know, that technology can be shared to a certain extent, but not with other applications like Draw or PaintShop Pro or any other software Corel makes that also have brushes. Um, John is wondering, can you save as a vector file? I think I you can in 2018. Yeah, no. but not in Essentials. I'm sure because we don't even have vector tools in essentials yeah. so essentials was built you know to give a core set of tools to get your feet wet and painting and not the whole kit and caboodle um, it just makes yeah. it easier to get into things if you don't have 900 brushes and you know mm -hmm. 200 more tools to work with. All right, well, I feel like, I hope I didn't miss anybody's question. If I did, please throw it in the questions panel right now, but I think we did a pretty good job of addressing everything here. And I just wanna let you know that there's a lot of people saying they love your artwork and they learned a lot and that they really oh, enjoyed this session. That's great. Yeah. It was a wonderful session. Cool, thank you very much. Thanks everybody for watching. Okay, one more question and then we're done. And are the RIF files backward compatible? Um, so you can go from an earlier version up, but up, back, you know what? I'm gonna have to double check. Oh, I, I don't think. I want to say no, um, but I think it depends on the tools you use because I yeah. feel like I've opened things up in 2018 and then used some of the newer tools and then went back and it wasn't compatible. Yeah, but for if, instance, I think if you use the same stuff. Yeah, sorry. anything that has a special media layer. So with 2018, we introduced thick paint. I think you can probably save the riff and open it up in 2017, but your thick paint will at least not be active 
So let me double check on that for you. I'm sorry, I should know the answer, Terry, but I'm gonna have to follow up on that one. So I have one to get you post-session. So we did record this. I will let this process and throw it up on YouTube today. And then GoToWebinar will send, it sends the follow-up email that I'll put the link in for everybody that'll go out to you probably tomorrow afternoon. So if you wanna re-watch over Easter weekend, you can. And uh, so I guess that concludes our webinar today. Please make sure that um, you can always check our webinars page or our Discovery Center to see what upcoming webinars we have. And of course, we'll always send out an email to remind everybody. And we greatly appreciate everybody for coming to our webinars on a regular basis. Um, it's wonderful to have you. And Brandon, thank you so much for preparing a very informational session. I'm going to go back and watch oh, them. <laughs> All right, guys. Thank you. Have a great day. I'm going to go ahead and shut this down now. So All righty. All right. Take care. Bye. Bye.